Autobiography of George Mueller, or A Million and a Half Answers to Prayer. Chapter 14, Personal Matters, from 1844 to 1885. Mr. Mueller's earlier personal history has been given in chapters 1 to 7. Soon after my return from Germany in 1844, I had it laid on my heart to go there again for a season. But before doing so, I felt called upon to prepare for a press, a new edition of my narrative. For this, however, a large sum of money was required, for I purposed to print not less than 4,000 copies. As I had no money of my own for this object, I gave myself to prayer, and after having prayed several months respecting it, I received on December the 30th, 1844, unasked for, the sum which would be needed to accomplish this object. 1844, December 31st. The Lord has been pleased to give me during this year 267 pounds, 6 shillings, 9 dimes. To this is to be added that, for the first two months and six days of this year, my expenses and those of my dear wife during our stay in Germany and also our traveling expenses back were met, as I already stated, in full. Also, during the whole of this year, a Christian lady gave to our dear child board and schooling without any remuneration, a present worth to us not less than 50 pounds. After our daughter had been at school for half a year, I asked for the account when it was stated to me by the Christian lady in whose establishment she was that she had a pleasure in educating her gratuitously. However, as I pressed the matter, I obtained the account. It was paid, but the exact sum was returned to me anonymously, which, of course, I found out at once to be the Christian sister at whose school my daughter was. From that time, I could never more obtain the account, though my dear child was about six years longer at school. I refer to this point for this special reason. God had laid it on my heart to care about poor destitute orphans. To this service I had been led to give myself. He in return, as a recompense even for this life, took care that my own beloved child should have a very good education, free of expense to me. I was able and well able to pay for her education and most willing to do so, but the Lord gave it gratuitously thus also showing how ready he is, abundantly, to help me and to supply my wants. Personal Matters, 1845, Visits Germany, January 6th. Today I received the most painful information, that a false teacher from Switzerland had found his way among the brethren and sisters at Sturt, um, it's S-T-U-T-T-G-A-R-T, and that through him several, yea, almost all, to a greater or less degree, has been drawn aside and shaken as to the very foundation of their faith. I cannot describe how bitter the trial was to me to see the Lord thus dishonored and my service for seven months during the previous year to all appearance entirely frustrated. The Lord, however, laid these brethren and sisters on my heart in prayer so that I was day by day enabled to bring them before God and also to resolve that as soon as my path was made plain, I would go again to Stargate, um, S-T-U-D-T-G-A-R-T, for a season. May 3rd, I have seen it more and more clearly of late that the time is drawn near when I shall go again to Germany to labor there for a time. For the brethren who had fallen into grievous errors are now recovering out of them, but need a helping hand to restore them fully, or at least to confirm them in the truth. In addition to this, I purpose to publish some tracts in German. But, though it is now four months since I have been daily praying respecting this object, I never had been led to ask the Lord to give me means for it, because I felt assured that when his time was come for me to go, he would provide the means, and also because I had never felt myself led to pray about it. Today, however, I ask the Lord that he would provide the means for all that is necessary in connection with this service, and I had a secret satisfaction in feeling that so much was required. An example, means for the journey to and fro, means for our stay there, means for the publication of tracts, and means to be left behind for the work in Bristol, to supply the need at least for a time, 
but I did not wish to go unless it were the Lord's will, and if so, he would give me the means. Now see how the Lord dealt with me about a quarter of an hour after I had been in prayer with my dear wife respecting this object, and I had now, for the first time, asked him for means to carry it out, though for four months we had daily prayed together respecting spiritual success in this service, I received a letter containing an order for 500 pounds. In this letter was written, I enclose 500 pounds, which will be more useful in your hands than in mine. I meant it in the first place for all that is needed preparatory to and attendance upon your journey to Germany, and whatever surplus may be, you will apply as you find there is need in the different parts of service under your care. Thus the Lord has fully answered our request for means, and that so speedily. On July 19th, my dear wife and I left Bristol for Stuttgart. I should have liked to preach the gospel in the streets or in the marketplaces in Germany, but for that there was no liberty. I did, therefore, what I could in spreading about 1,100 copies of my narrative and tens of thousands of tracts. In this, I was particularly encouraged by remembering that the great work at the time of the Reformation was chiefly accomplished by means of printed publications. We traveled in a hired carriage for 17 days, each day about 40 or 45 miles. I had a box containing about 30,000 tracts made on purpose behind the carriage. In the fourth part, several port, P-O-R-T-M-A-N-T-E-A-U-S, filled with tracts and copies of my narrative in German. As we went on, my dear wife and I looked out for travelers who were coming or persons on the roadside and handed the books or tracts to them. Perhaps the reader may ask, what has been the result of the labor in Germany? My reply is, God only knows. The day of Christ will declare it. Judging from the constant labor in prayer, during eight months before we went, and day by day while we were on the continent, and day by day for a long time after our return, I am warranted to expect fruit, and I do expect it. I expect abundant fruit in the day of Christ appearing. In the meantime, my comfort is that 220,000 tracts have been circulated, many of which, through the providence of God, found their way not only into the darkest places of the continent of Europe, but went also to America and Australia. Further, the 4,000 copies of the narrative in German are almost all circulated. And again, the publishing of my narrative in German led me to do the same in French, which was accomplished about three years later. Further, these tracts were reprinted at Hamburg and at Cologne and are circulated by other Christians, in addition to which my having published them in Germany led me to get them stereotyped in England, and they continue to be circulated in many countries. December 31st, during this year, the Lord has been pleased to give to me another 433 pounds, 19 shillings, one and three quarter dime. Also, again, during the whole of this year, my dear child had her education free at a boarding school, as stated at the close of the last year, whereby I saved about 50 pounds. Also, my traveling expenses to and from Germany and other expenses connected with my service in Germany were paid out of the 500 pounds in which reference has been made. Adding these two items to 433 pounds, I had at least 500 pounds. Esteemed reader, what do you think of this? Is it not a pleasant thing in the end, even for this life, really to trust in God? Verily thus I have found it to be, and thus do I find it to be the longer I live. Only there must be real trust in God, and it must be more than merely using words. If we trust in God, we look to Him alone. We deal with Him alone, and we are satisfied with His knowing about our need. Two things I add as I write my experience about the Lord's dealings with me for the profit of the saints. During the last year, I resolved that, by God's help, I would seek to be more than ever a channel for the communication of God's bounties and to communicate to those in need or to give to the work of God. I acted according to the light which God gave me, and he can condescended to make it his steward in one way or another far more abundantly than ever before. Would we wish to have means entrusted to us by the Lord or to succeed in our trade, business, profession, etc.? We must be truly desirous of being his stewards and only his stewards. In looking over my journal, I find that during this year also, I was more than once without a shilling, yea, without a penny. 
though my income was about 500 pounds. 1846, conversion of Lydia Mueller. April 29th, today my beloved wife and myself had the inexpressibly great joy of receiving a letter from our beloved daughter while we are staying in the Lord's service at Chippenham, in which she writes that she has now found peace in the Lord Jesus. Thus our prayers are turned into praises. The following is a copy of part of the letter referred to. My very dear father and mother, I am so very glad that you are doing better. I am much obliged for dear mother's kind note. Dearest father and mother, I wish to tell you that I was now happy, but I have not liked to, and I thought I could do better, could better tell you in writing than by speaking. I do not know exactly the time when I first was happy in the prospect of death and eternity, but I know that the work of God in my heart was very gradual. I can now say, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Please, dear father and mother, to pray for me, that I may be kept from dishonoring God, and that I may be more and more thankful to him for the gift of his son, and for my dear parents, my dear auntie, my dear teachers, and all kind friends who love me and pray for me. And now, dear father and mother, with much love, I remain affectionately your little daughter, Lydia Mueller. After hearing from her in April, she was not received at once to communion, but being so young, I judged it desirable to watch the work in her soul. Towards the end of the year, however, my fellow laborers being fully satisfied, she was baptized and received into communion when she was 14 years and three months old. December 31st. The Lord has been pleased to give me during this year 399 pounds, 2 shillings, 11 dimes. To this is again to be added that during the whole of the year also my daughter was free of all expenses at a boarding school. This was worth about 50 pounds. 1847, December 31st. During this year the Lord has been pleased to give me 412 pounds, 18 shillings, 8 and half dimes. To this there is again to be added the free education of my dear daughter at a boarding school worth to us at least 50 pounds. 1848. In April, I was enabled by the help of the Lord to complete all the arrangements for the publication of the narrative of the Lord's dealings with me in the French language. 1848-1851. December 31, 1848. During this year, the Lord was pleased to give me 474 pounds, 17 shillings, 7 dimes. In 1849, 413 pounds, 2 shillings, 4 dimes. In 1850, 402 pounds, 4 shillings, 5 dimes. And in 1851, 465 pounds, 13 shillings, 1 and 3 quarter dime. 1852, December 31st, the Lord has been pleased to give me during this year 445 pounds, 8 shillings, 8 and a half dimes. My brother-in-law, Mr. A. N. Gross, of whom mention has been made as having been helpful to me by his example when I began my labors in England, in 1829, in that he, without any visible support and without being connected with any missionary society, went with his wife and children to Baghdad as a missionary after having given up a lucrative practice of about 1,500 pounds per year, returned in autumn 1852 from the East Indies a third time, being extremely ill. He lived, however, till May 20th, 1853, when after a most blessed testimony for the Lord, he fell asleep in the Lord, in my house. 1853, illness of Lydia Mueller. In July, it pleased the Lord to take, try my faith in a way in which before it had not been tried. My beloved daughter was taken ill on June 20th. This illness proved to be typhoid fever. On July 3rd, there seemed no hope of her recovery. Now was the trial of faith, but faith triumphant. My beloved wife and I were enabled to give her up into the hands of the Lord. He sustained us both. But I will only speak about myself. Though my only and beloved child was brought near the grave, yet was my soul in perfect peace, satisfied with the will of my Heavenly Father, being assured that he would only do that for her and her parents, which in the end would be the best. She continued very ill till about July 20th, when restoration began. 
On August the 18th, though exceedingly weak, she was so far restored that she could be removed to Clefton for change of air. It was then, 59 days since she was first taken ill. While I was in this affliction, this great affliction, besides being at peace, so far as the Lord's dispensation was concerned, I also felt perfectly at peace with regard to the cause of the affliction. Once on a former occasion, the hand of the Lord was heavily laid on me and my family. I had not the least hesitation in knowing that it was the Father's rod applied in infinite wisdom and love for the restoration of my soul from a state of lukewarmness. At this time, however, I had no such feeling, conscious as I was of manifold weaknesses, failings, and shortcomings, so that I, too, would be ready to say with the Apostle Paul, O wretched man that I am, yet I was assured that this affliction was not upon me in this way of the fatherly rot, but for the trial of my faith. Persons ought often have no doubt the idea respecting me that all my trials of faith regard matters connecting with money, though the reverse has been stated by me very frequently. Now, however, the Lord w would try my faith concerning one of my dearest earthly treasures, yet next to my beloved wife, the dearest of all my earthly possessions. Parents know what an only child, a beloved child is, and what to believing parents an only child must be. Well, the Father in heaven said, as it were, by this his dispensation, art thou willing to give up this child to me? My heart responded, as it seems good to thee, my heavenly Father, thy will be done. But as our hearts were made willing to give back our beloved child to him who had given her to us, so he was ready to leave her to us, and she lived. To lie thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. Psalms 37, verse 4. The desires of my heart were to retain the beloved daughter if it were the will of God. The means to retain her were to be satisfied with the will of the Lord. Of all the trials of faith that as yet I have had to pass through, this was the greatest, and by God's abundant mercy I own it to his praise. I was enabled to desert myself in the will of God, for I felt perfectly sure that if the Lord took this beloved daughter, it would be the best for her parents, best for herself, and more for the glory of God than if she lived. This better part I was satisfied with, and thus my heart had peace, perfect peace, and I had not a moment's anxiety. This would be under all circumstances, however painful, were the believer exercising faith. December 31st, during this year, the Lord was pleased to give me 638 pounds, 11 shillings, 8 and a half times. 1854, December 31st, the Lord has been pleased to give me during this year 697 pounds, 11 shillings, 5 dimes. Some of my readers may be ready to exclaim, 697 pounds, 11 shillings, 5 dimes. What a large sum. Not one out of a hundred ministers has such a large salary, nor one out of twenty clergymen such a good living. Should you, esteem readers, say so, my reply is, indeed, mine is a happy way for the attaining of my temporal supplies. But if any one desires to go this way, he must not merely say that he trusts in God, but must really do so. Often individuals profess to trust in God, but they embrace every opportunity, directly or indirectly, to expose their need, and thus seek to induce persons to help them. I do not say it is wrong to make known our wants, but I do say it ill agrees with trust in God to expose our wants for the sake of inducing persons to help us. God will take us at our word. If we say we trust in Him, He will try whether we really do so or only profess to do so, and if indeed we trust in Him, we are satisfied to stand with Him alone. The individual who desires to go this way must be willing to be rich or poor as the Lord pleases. He must be willing to know what it is to have an abundancy or scarcely anything. He must be willing to live, leave this world without any possessions. He must be willing to take the money in God's way, not merely in large sums, but in small. Again and again have I had a single shilling given or sent to me. To have refused such tokens of Christian love would have been ungracious. He must be willing to live as the Lord's steward. 
If anyone were to begin this way of living and did not communicate out of that which the Lord gives to him but hoards it up, or if he would live up to his income, as it is called, then the Lord who influences the heart of his children to help him with means would soon cause those channels to be dried up. Various reasons might have kept me from publishing these accounts, but I have for my object in writing the glory of God, and therefore delight in thus showing what a loving master I serve and how bountifully he supplies my necessities. And I write for the comfort and encouragement of my fellow believers, that they may be led to trust in God more and more. And therefore I feel it due to them to state how, even with regard to this life, I am amply provided for, though that is not what I seek after. 1855, December 31st. During this year, the Lord has been pleased to give me 726 pounds, 16 shillings, two and a quarter time. This, dear reader, is the writer's statement after having acted on these principles for more than 25 years. You see, not for a week, a month, or even a year, how the writer has been dealt with by the Lord after he had sent out in this way. But in all simplicity, he has related to you how it has been with him year after year. 1856. In 1855, I plainly stated in figures how abundantly the Lord has been pleased, simply through trusting in him to supply all my temporal necessities. I did this to the honor of the Lord, and in entire dependency upon God. For looking at it naturally, the result would be that my dear Christian friends, who had before that time felt interested in my temporal affairs, would say that I received such an abundancy that they needed no longer to support me with means. But, though this would be naturally suggested to me, yet, since I had only the honor of God in view, in writing the Lord's dealings with me, and not my honor or my temporal advantage, I wrote as I did, whatever the consequences as to my temporal interests might be. And what has been the result? Some of my Christian friends have indeed said, Mr. Mueller is so well supported that he does not need anything from us. But how has the Lord acted? He knew that I had held his bountiful supplies as his steward only, and that I did not wish to lay up money, but counted it an honor to spend it for him. And therefore, though some of the ground of my abundancy have withheld, he himself has honored more and more, not only my trust in him, but also the principles on which I acted with reference to stewardship so that instead of having far less, God has given me, year by year, a greater abundance still. During the very first month after my narrative had appeared before the eye of the public, I received a greater amount of money than ever I had received during one month in my whole life before. And from that time it has been, I may say, one continual stream of abundancy. When on the 31st of December, 1856, I made up my accounts. I found that I had received, in the course of the year, 781 pounds, seven dimes. Thus, the poor foreigner, whose whole possession was five pounds, when he began to labor for the Lord in this country, had now received, during one year, 781 pounds, seven dimes, simply in answer to prayer, without asking anyone for anything, and without a shilling of salary either in connection with the ministry of the word or as the director of the scriptural knowledge institution. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Psalms 34, verse 8. 1857, January 20th. I had given to me for myself 150 pounds, October 12th. Today I heard of the conversion of a gentleman for whose conversion I had been daily praying for 12 years and 11 months, viz. since November 1844. How great my joy was on this account. Those can easily understand who, after having long waited upon the Lord, at last have their prayers answered. December 31st. On this day I found that, during the past year, the Lord had been pleased to give me 836 pounds, 11 shillings, two and a half quarter dimes. 1858. On June 19th, a Christian lady in Berkshire, whom I had never seen 
sent me 100 pounds for my own personal expenses. And on August 6th, a Christian gentleman at Birmingham sent me 100 pounds with a special wish to use it in taking care of my health. This last donation came to hand almost instantly after I had given to a Christian brother in business who was in great difficulty, a considerable sum, in order to enable him to continue his business. And thus the Lord again proved how he had taken notice of this and how he was willing yet further and further to supply me with means for his work or the necessities of those among whom more especially my lot was cast. December 31st. During this year, the Lord was pleased to give me 1,029 pounds, one shilling, 11 and a quarter dimes. Do you see, esteemed reader, how my income increased more and more? And how came this? Because I acted according to the injunctions of the Lord in regard to the means which, with which He was pleased to entrust me. At least it was my aim so to do. As He was pleased to give me means, so his own blessed work was remembered. As to missions, the circulation of the Holy Scriptures and tracts, etc., and as he was pleased to entrust me with means, the orphan, the widow, the poor generally, and especially also poor believers, were remembered. And with all this, relatives also had a share out of that with which I was entrusted in case they needed it. And so it came that the Lord was pleased to give me more and more. 1859. February the 10th, this day, 30 years ago, I left my father's house to set out for England. How wonderfully has the Lord dealt with me since. June 18th, received from a baroness in Holland, whose name I had not even heard before, 17 pounds, 2 shillings, 7 dimes, as one of the numberless ways in which God has been pleased to supply me with means for myself. On October 7th, it was 29 years since I was united in marriage to my beloved, excellent wife, who, with very little interruption, enjoyed very good health up to this time. But at the end of the 29th year of our continual union, she was laid aside by rheumatism, became a great sufferer, and continued a sufferer month after month, till about the middle of the year, 1860. So that for about nine months, this most devoted servant of the Lord Jesus was almost entirely helpless and unable to work. And yet this great affliction to her and to me was so used by the Lord in the reestablishing of her health and strength that she was, through this very affliction, which obliged her to rest so much, spared to me and the work of the Lord for ten years longer than otherwise, humanly speaking, she might have been. When my beloved wife was first taken ill, I said to myself, The Lord has graciously continued to me, this beloved wife, for twenty-nine years, in almost uninterrupted good health, it becomes me, therefore, not only to be satisfied with his holy will concerning this affliction, but particularly to seek to look at the Lord's kindness in her almost uninterrupted good health, instead of dwelling only on the trial of her present illness. December 31st, during the past year, the Lord has been pleased to give me 1,037 pounds, 12 shillings, 10 and 3 quarters dimes. 1860, January 14th. Last evening I sent off five pounds ten shillings for four poor saints and two pounds ten shillings for the Lord's work, and today I received a present of one hundred and fifty pounds for myself. I refer to this and other such instances as the best practical illustration of the truth of that word. There is that scattereth and yet increases. Proverbs eleven twenty four. December thirty first. During the past year the Lord has been pleased to give me one thousand fifty four pounds. Nine shillings and a half dime. Observe, esteemed reader, the steady increase of my in income. The Lord entrusted me with more and more. Why? Because by His grace I sought to act for Him as His steward and had therefore not only for myself and family all the necessities, yea, all the conveniences of life, but also the joy, the honor, and precious privilege of being allowed to give away year by year a large sum comparatively. 1861 and 1862. December 31st, 1861. During this year, the Lord has been pleased to give me 1,097 pounds, 12 shillings, 6 and 3 quarter dime. December 31st, 1862. During this year, the Lord has been pleased to give me 1,067 pounds, 6 shillings, 11 and a half times. In going over these accounts in which every shilling received by me was entered, I find how great is 
a number of kind Christian friends who helped me with their means in regard to my private expenses who have fallen asleep since. But while they have been removed and therefore their kind help has failed, my never-failing friend, the living God, has remained to me and has continued most abundantly to help me year after year. Nor do I doubt in the least that he will continue to help me to the end of my course. 1863 to 1865, Mr. Mueller's Investments, December 31, 1863. During this year, the Lord has been pleased to give me 1,172 pounds, 10 shillings, six and a half times. December 31, 1864. During this year, the Lord has been pleased to give me 1,230 pounds, 15 shillings, seven and a quarter dimes. The reader may exclaim, 1,230 pounds? What a large sum. Yes, esteemed reader, it is a large sum. And what did Mr. Mueller do with all this money? Did he invest it? Yes, I did. I had a beloved wife, a most beloved wife. I had a daughter, a most beloved daughter, and the best provision I could make for them was to seek week after week, month after month, year after year, to lay up treasure in heaven. And this I did. And so it came that as I had always an abundance of opportunities to spend my means in the Lord's work, or on poor saints or on poor unconverted persons, now and then also in connection with relatives who were in need, I was generally at the close of each succeeding year as I had been at the close of the previous year, viz., without property, insofar as regards earthly possessions. But at the same time, it pleased the Lord yet further to entrust his servant not only with means for himself, but to give to him more than ever, as the reader will see in what follows. The great secret in stewardship, if we desire to be entrusted with more, is to be faithful in the stewardship, which implies that we do not consider what we have to belong to ourselves, but to the Lord. This, by God's grace, I have sought to do, and at the same time, trusted in God fully. And thus, it has come that I have abundant, abounded more and more. All this I write, but by God's grace, not in self-complacency, but with self-abasement. But I write it, that my brother, brethren in Christ may be benefited, and that it may be seen that discipleship can be carried out in the 19th century as fully as ever, and with regard to not laying up treasure upon earth in particular. December 31, 1865. During this year, the Lord has been pleased to give me 1,365 pounds, four shillings, one and a half times. 1866. Death of Mr. Craig. January 22nd. This evening, about half past eleven, my beloved fellow laborer and intimate friend for thirty-six years, Mr. Henry Craig, fell asleep after an illness of seven months. Both of us had then known the Lord a little over forty years, and both of us were then a little above sixty years of age. My beloved brother and friend now had his course finished. I was privileged and honored further to labor for the Lord and to do this now without him with whom I had often taken counsel. My heart, however, as in all my former trials and difficulties, looked to the Lord whom I knew, and on whom I had been in the habit practically of leaning for more than 36 years. And now, 1874, after the lapse of all these years since that mournful event, I have to state to his praise that he has helped me, and that in every way his blessing has been continued to me, and even far more abundantly than before. January 30th, the earthly remains of my beloved friend, Mr. Craig, were committed to the grave this day. But I am ill at home and became much worse this evening. For about three months afterwards, I was more or less in a feeble state of health. December 31st, during this year, the Lord has been pleased to give me 1,602 pounds, one shilling, six and a half times. 1867, December 31st, during this year the Lord has been pleased to give me 1,847 pounds, 19 shillings, four and a half times. Notice particularly, esteemed reader, that I was not one year or another year or these far between bountifully supplied by the Lord, but year after year. Observe also in particular that these donations were received from hundreds of donors who were residing not only in various parts of England, Scotland, and Ireland, but in France, Switzerland, Italy, Germany, Denmark, Sweden, Holland, Belgium, Canada, 
the United States, India, Australia, New Zealand, China, etc. There is scarcely a country in the world from whence I have not received donations for myself as well as for the Scriptural Knowledge Institution, which furnishes another precious proof that the hearts of all men are in the hands of God, and that if we have Him on our side, we cannot but be cared for and helped, whatever our position may be, and wherever our lot may be cast. When the Israelites wandered through the wilderness, they had food, water to drink, raiment, and everything they really needed. And had they not rebelled against God, they would have fared still better, humanly speaking, notwithstanding their wilderness position. 1868 to 1870. To December 31st, 1868. During this year, the Lord has been pleased to give me 1,838 pounds, 17 shillings, four and a half times. What a goodly sum again, more than six times as much as I need for myself and family. And I have not only all the necessities, but all the conveniences of life. April 28, 1869. Today, I drew check 10,000. I mention this to the reader to show the greatness of my business arrangements. December 31, 1869. During this year, the Lord has been pleased to give me 1,800 pounds, 16 shillings, 10 and a half times. Death of Mrs. Mueller, February 6, 1870. On October 7, 1830, therefore 39 years and 4 months ago, the Lord gave me my most valuable, lovely, and holy wife. Her value to me and the blessing God made her to be to me is beyond description. This blessing has continued to me till this day, when this afternoon, about four o'clock, the Lord took her to himself. February the 11th. Today the earthly remains of my precious wife were laid in the grave. Many thousands of persons showed the deepest sympathy. About 1,200 of the orphans who were able to walk followed in the procession. The whole staff of helpers at the orphan houses, who could be spared, and hundreds of believers at the church, with which he had been in communion, I myself, sustained by the Lord to the utmost, performed the service at the chapel, in the cemetery, etc. Preaches Mrs. Mueller's funeral sermon. Shortly after the funeral, I was very unwell, but as soon as I was sufficiently recovered, I preached my late dear wife's funeral sermon. As all the principal matters connected with her illness, her removal, her happy congenial life, and her usefulness as a helper to me in the work of the Lord are contained in the funeral sermon, I give it here, and also because the reader will thus be furnished somewhat better with the inner life and the ways of the writer than otherwise he would. Some parts are now admitted. Thou art good, and doest good. Psalms 119, verse 68. The reason why I purpose to preach this funeral sermon is not because the late Mrs. Mueller was my own beloved wife, nor that I might have an opportunity of speaking highly of her, most worthy though she was of it but that I may magnify the Lord in giving her to me, in leaving her to me so long, and in taking her from me to himself. At the same time, it appeared to me well, as she became the first member of the church assembly at Bethsaida when it was formed in August 1832, and as her whole life ever since then has been of the most blameless character, that at the departure of such a Christian, we should ponder the lessons which her life is calculated to teach. During the six days that my beloved wife was on her deathbed, my soul was sustained by the truth contained in the words of our text, whether she was more easily from pain or in severe pain, whether there was a little prospect that she might yet be given back to me, or whether all hope was gone. My soul was sustained by these words. They were ever present with me, and I rested my soul on them. When it pleased God to take my darling wife to himself, my soul was so sustained by these words that if I had gone out that evening to preach, I should have preached on this text. I desire now, as God may help me, for the benefit of my younger fellow believers in Christ particularly, to dwell on the truth contained in these words, with reference to my beloved departed wife. Number one, the Lord was good and did good in giving her to me. Number two, he was good and did good and so long, leaving her to me. Number three, he was good and did good in taking her from me. Number one, in giving her to me, I own the hand of God. Nay, his hand was most marked. And my soul says, thou art good and doest good. 
When at the end of the year, 1829, I left London to labor in Devonshire in the gospel, a brother in the Lord gave to me a card containing the address of a well-known Christian lady, Mrs. Page, who then resided in Exeter, in order that I should call on her. I took this address, but thought little of calling on her. For three weeks I carried this card in my pocket without making an effort to see this lady. But at last I was led to do so. This was God's way of giving me my excellent wife. Miss Paget asked me to preach the last Tuesday in January 1830 at the room which she had fitted up at Baltimore, a village near Exeter, and where Mr. A. N. Groves, afterwards my brother-in-law, had preached once a month before he went out as a missionary to Baghdad. I accepted readily the invitation. On leaving, Mrs. Page, she gave me the address of a Christian brother, Mr. Haig, who had an infant boarding school at Northern Hay House, the former residence of Mr. A. N. Groves, in order that I might stay there on my arrival in Exeter from Tenemouth. To this place I went at the appointed time. Mrs. Groves, afterwards my beloved wife, was there, or Miss Groves, for Mrs. Haig had been a great invalid for a long time, and Miss Groves helped Mr. Haig in his great affliction by superintending his household matters. My first visit led to my going again to preach at Baltimore after the lapse of a month, and I stayed again at Mr. Haig's house. And this second visit led to my preaching once a week in a chapel at Exeter. And thus I went, week after week, from Tenemel to Exeter, each time staying in the house of Mr. Haig. Engagement. All this time my purpose had been not to marry at all, but to remain free for traveling about in the service of the gospel. But after some months I saw, for many reasons, that it was better for me, as a young pastor, under 25 years of age, to be married. The question now was, to whom shall I be united? Miss Groves was before my mind, but the prayerful conflict was long before I came to a decision, for I could not bear the thought that I should take away from Mr. Haig, this valued helper, as Mrs. Haig continued still unable to take the responsibility of so large a household, but I prayed again and again. At last, this decided me. I had reason to believe that I had begotten an affection in the heart of Miss, Miss Groves for me and that therefore I ought to make a proposal of marriage to her. However unkindly I might appear to act to my dear friend and brother, Mr. Hayes, and to ask God to give him a suitable helper to succeed in Miss Groves. On August 15, 1830, I, w I therefore wrote to her, proposing to her to become my wife, and on August the 19th, when I went over as usual to Exeter for preaching, she accepted me. The first thing we did after I was accepted was to fall on our knees and to ask the blessing of the Lord on our intended union. Marriage. In about two or three weeks, the Lord, in answer to prayer, found an individual who seemed suitable to act as housekeeper. While Mrs. Hicks continued ill, and on October 7, 1830, we were united in marriage. Our marriage was of the most simple character. We walked to church, had no wedding breakfast, but in the afternoon had a meeting of Christian friends in Mr. Hicks' house and commemorated commemorated the Lord's death. And then I drove off in the stagecoach with my beloved bride to Tenemoth. And the next day we went to work for the Lord. Simple as our beginning was, and unlike the habits of the world, for Christ's sake, so our godly aim has been to continue ever since. Now see the hand of the Lord in giving me my dearest wife. Number one, that address of Mrs. Paget was given to me under the ordering of God. Number two, I must at last be, called, be made to call on her though I had long delayed it. Number three, she might have provided a resting place with some other Christian friend where I should not have seen Mrs. Miss Groves. Number four, my mind might have at la last, after all, decided not to make a proposal to her. But God settled the matter thus in speaking to me through my conscience. You know that you have begotten affection in the heart of this Christian sister. By the way you have acted towards her, and therefore, painful though it may be, to appear to act unkindly towards your friend and brother, you ought to make her a proposal. I obey. I wrote the letter in which I made the proposal, and nothing but one even stream of blessing has been the result. I think it is plain that he who is good and doeth good had given me Miss Groves for a wife. Estimate of Mrs. Mueller's worth. 
Let us now see for a few moments what I had received in her as God's gift. I mention here, as her chief excellency, that she was a truly devoted Christian. She had for her one object of life, to live for God, and during the 39 years and four months that I was united to her, her steady purpose to live for God increased more and more. She was also, as a Christian friend, of a meek and quiet spirit. I speak to those who knew her, and not a few of whom knew her 30 years and upwards, and who know what a very excellent Christian she was. If all Christians were like her, the joys of heaven would be found on earth far more abundantly than they are now. In her, God had been pleased to give me a Christian wife, who never at any time hindered me in the ways of God, but sought to strengthen my hands in God, and this too, in the deepest trials, under the greatest difficulties, and when the service in which she helped me brought on her the greatest personal sacrifices. When, during the years from September 1838 to the end of 1846, we had the greatest trials of faith in the orphan work, and when hundreds of times the necessities of the orphans could only be met by our means, and when often all our own money had to be expended, that precious wife never found fault with me, but heartily joined me in prayer for help with, from God, and with me looked out for help, and help came. And then we rejoiced together and often wept for joy together. But the precious wife, who was God's own gift to me, was exquisitely suited to me, even naturally, by her temperament. Thousands of times I said to her, My darling, God himself singled you out for me as the most suitable wife I could possibly wish to have had. Then, as to her education, she was just all I could have wished. She had had a very good and sound education, and she knew, besides the accomplishments of a lady, she played nicely and painted beautifully. Though not five minutes were spent at the piano or in drawing or painting after our marriage, she possessed superior knowledge of astronomy, was exceedingly well grounded in English grammar and geography, had a fair knowledge of history and French, had also begun Latin and Hebrew and learned German. When in 1843 and 1845 she accompanied me in my service to Germany. All this cultivation of mine became not only helpful in the education of our daughter, but was more or less used by the Lord in his service to the praise of his name. She was a very good arithmetic person, which for 34 years was a great help to me, for she habitually examined month by month all the account books and the hundreds of bills of the matrons of the various orphan houses, and should any tradesman or matron have made the least mistake, it would be surely found out by her. But in addition to the good education of a lady she possessed, what in our days is so rare among ladies, a thorough knowledge of useful needlework of every kind, and an excellent knowledge of the quality of material for clothes, linen, etc. And thus became so eminently useful as a wife of the director of the orphan houses, where hundreds of thousands of yards of material of all kinds had to be ordered by her, and to be approved of or to be rejected. My beloved wife could do fancy needlework as other ladies, and had done it when young, but she did not thus occupy her time, especially she would with her own dear hands now and then knit a purse for her husband while she was in the country for the change of air. Her occupation had habitually a useful end. It was to get ready the many hundreds of neat little beds for the dear orphans, most of whom had never seen such beds, far less slept in them, that she labored. It was to get good beds that she was busied, thus to serve the Lord Jesus, in caring for these dear, bereaved children who had not a mother or father to care for them. It was to provide numerous other 
useful things in the orphan houses, and especially for the sick rooms of the orphans, that day by day, except in the Lord's day, she was seen in the orphan houses. The knowledge which is useful to help the needy, to alleviate suffering, to make a useful wife, a useful mother, how far above the value of doing fancy work. Mrs. Mueller preeminently possessed and valued useful knowledge. She and her dear sisters had been brought up by a wise as well as loving mother who saw to it that while there was nothing spared with regard to a good school and the attendancy of good masters, etc., her daughters should also be eminent in useful knowledge. May Christian mothers who hear me now take heed that their daughters have an education which will make them useful wives and useful mothers. Happiness of their married life. We have seen now that God himself had given me my beloved wife. We have also seen how suitable she was to me, and in the gift of such a wife, a good foundation for real conjoinal happiness was laid. And were we happy? Verily we were. With every year our happiness increased more and more. I never saw my beautiful, beloved wife at any time when I met her unexpectedly anywhere in Bristol without being delighted to do. I never met her even in the orphan houses without my heart being delighted so to do. Day by day as we met in our dressing room at the orphan houses to wash her hands before dinner and tea. I was delighted to meet her, and she was equally pleased to see me. Thousands of times I told her, My darling, I never saw you at any time since you became my wife without my being delighted to see you. This was not only our way in the first year of our marriage union, nor in the tenth, nor in the twentieth, and in the thirtieth year, but also in the fortieth year of our congenial life. Thus, I spoke to her many times since the 7th of October, 1830. Further, day after day, if anyhow it could be done, I spent after dinner 20 minutes or half an hour with her in her room at the orphan houses, seated on her couch with a Christian brother had sent her in the year 1860 when she was, for about nine months, so ill with rheumatism. I knew that it was good for her that her dear, active mind and hand should have rest. And I knew well that this would not be, except her husband was by her side. Moreover, I also needed a little rest after dinner, on account of my weak digestive powers. And therefore, I spent these precious moments with my darling wife. There we sat, side by side, her hand in mine as a habitual thing, having a few words of loving intercourse, or being silent, but most happy in the Lord and in each other. And thus it was many times since October 7, 1869, viz., in the 40th year of our congenial life. Our happiness in God and in each other was indescribable. We had not some happy days every year, nor a month of happiness every year. But we had 12 months of happiness in the year, and thus year after year. Often and often did I say to that beloved one, and this again and again, even in the 40th year of our congenital union, My darling, do you think there is a couple in Bristol or in the world happier than we are? Why do I refer to all this to show what a remarkable great blessing to a husband is truly godly? wife, who also in other respects is fitted for him. But while I own in the fullest degree that the foundation of true spiritual happiness in our marriage life was laid, and that my dearest wife was a decided Christian, and fitted for me by God in other respects, and thus given to me by him, yet at the same time I am most fully convinced that this was not enough for the continuation of real congenital happiness during a course of 39 years and 4 months had there not been more. 
I therefore must add here the following points. Number one, both of us, by God's grace, had one object of life, and only one, to live for Christ. Everything else was of a very inferior character to us. However weak and failing in a variety of ways, there was no swerving from this one holy object of life, this godly purpose and the godly aim day by day to carry out this purpose greatly added, of necessity added, to true happiness, and therefore in an increase of congenital happiness also. Should this be wanting in any two Christians who are united by marriage ties, let them not be surprised if congenital happiness, real congenital happiness, is also wanting. Number two, we had the blessing of having an abundancy of work to do, and we did that work. By God's grace, we gave ourselves to it. And this abundancy of work greatly tended instrumentality to the increase of our happiness. Our mornings never began with the uncertainty of how to spend the day and what to do. For as the day began, we had always an abundancy of work. I reckon this a special blessing, and it greatly increased our happiness and sweetened exceedingly the little while we had for rest in each other's society. Many, even true Christians, make the mistake of aiming after a position in which they may be free from work and have all their time on hand. They know not what they wish for, some very great evil, instead of some very great blessing. They forget that they desire a time when, for want of regular occupation, they will be particularly exposed to temptation. Number three, but great as habitually our occupation was, we never allowed this to interfere with the care about our own souls. Before we went to work, we had, as an habitual practice, our seasons for prayer and reading the scriptures. Should the children of God neglect this and let their work or service for God interfere with caring about their own souls, they cannot for any length be happy in God, and their congenital happiness must also suffer on account of it. Number four, lastly and most of all, to be noticed is this. We had for many years past, whether 20 or 30 years or more, I do not know, besides our seasons for private prayer and family prayer, also, habitually, our seasons for praying together. For many years, my precious wife and I had, immediately after family prayer in the morning, a short time for prayer together. One of the most important points for Thanksgiving or the most important points for prayer with regard to the day we brought before God. Should very heavy trials press on me, or should our need of any kind be particularly great, we prayed again after dinner, when I visited her in her room, as stated before. And this, at times of extraordinary difficulties or necessities, might be repeated once or twice more in the afternoon. Yet very rarely was this the case. Then in the evening, during the last hour of our stay at the orphan houses, though our work was never so much, it was an habitual understanding thing that this hour was for prayer. My beloved wife came then to my room, and now our prayer and supplication and intercession, mingled with thanksgiving, lasted generally 40 minutes, 50 minutes, and sometimes the whole hour. At these seasons, we brought perhaps 50 or more different points or persons or circumstances before God. The burden of our prayer was generally of the same character, except when prayers were turned into praises or when fresh points were added, or when peculiar mercies or blessings or peculiar difficulties and trials led during the part of the time to a variation. We never thus met for prayer without having on various accounts cause for thanksgiving. But at the same time, our seasons for prayer never arrived without our having abundant cause for casting our burden upon the Lord. These seasons for united prayer I mean, in addition to the family prayer, I particularly commend to all Christian wives and husbands. I judge that it was in our own history the great secret for the continuization, not only of congenital happiness, but of the love to each other, 
which was even more abundantly fresh and warm than it had been during the first year, though we were then exceedingly fond of each other. I now pass on to the second part of our precious text. Number two. The Lord was good and doing good in so long leaving to me my precious wife. 